Good afternoon. Thanks for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard. We've all heard the phrase virtual reality. It's a distinctly 21st century phrase that describes an artificial environment created with software. Virtual reality is presented to the user in such a way that the user suspends belief and accepts it as a real environment. It is the simulation of a real environment that makes virtual reality a powerful teaching tool. Keith Silva visited the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies in Burlington, where he learned about the latest virtual reality tool for farmers. Every so often, our camera captures what's best described as a surprise. So you can just turn around, it's right behind you. Oh, oh my God, oh wow. <laughs> That's there's me, whole, wearing the goofy looking goggles and laughing yeah. like a fool. Oh, wow. My excuse is that this is my first time experiencing virtual reality, or VR. My guides are Shannon Mitchell and Marguerite Dibble of Game Theory, a video game development company in Burlington. VR is basically a way to take a screen and put it right up close so it fully encompasses your sort of ocular view and it makes it feel like you are immersed in a game environment. The first thing you'll notice is this cool headband. Um, it's attached to the goggles, so it actually has two lenses here, one for each of your eyes, and it offsets it a little bit. So what each eye is seeing is a little bit different, which gives you that 3D effect. Um, and then we have headphones too, so you can hear it and uh, it's really cool. The real game that Dibble and Mitchell have created for this virtual environment teaches farmers how to scout for pests and plant diseases found in hop yards. The two were game for this idea after receiving an email. We got a random email from someone at the University of Vermont who said, we kind of want to make a game about training farmers. We kind of think maybe it should be in VR. Is that something you could maybe help with? And we said, yes, we could totally help with that. We'd be very excited to help with that. The random email Dibble received came from UVM Extension agronomist Heather Darby. My sister um, works in the school system and she was being trained on virtual reality technology to be used in the education system mm -hmm. and she immediately came home and said, Heather, you know, this would be really great for, for farmers. And immediately I thought, wow, you know, yeah, this would be a great tool to be able to teach farmers different practices in an environment that looks real maybe feels real, but isn't. The game works like this. A player travels through a hop yard, and when they spot a leaf that doesn't look quite right, they can pull it down using a controller and examine it from front to back to identify what they're seeing. We're keeping score here. We are keeping score, because that, that's so important. You can't really get better unless you know how you've done. You don't know what you don't know. So uh, going through, it'll tell you what you're really good at identifying and what you miss out on, which is really good for reflection and, and seeing how you can improve. I wouldn't call it winning. The real winning is learning. For most of us, a game that simulates pest and disease identification doesn't sound like a lot of fun. But Darby and Dibble both saw the potential audience and situation for this project as a perfect fit. Farmers work best by doing, and we know that, so they don't really respond that well to sitting in a classroom, watching a PowerPoint, taking notes. Farmers like to be outside, they like to learn by doing. So in the winter time, when they have the opportunity to learn, we can't be doing. My whole thought process was, can we teach farmers how to scout for insect pests, as an example, through virtual reality technology and environments so that they really feel like they're doing? I grew up in Vermont. I have a lot of friends who are farmers, and they are the busiest people alive. But they're also super curious people. They want to learn. They want to grow. And that's one of the reasons why I thought this project was a good fit for our type of solutions is because it's a way to create that environment and create a game around it that's actually solving a challenge, right? People don't have time, as much time as they would like, to go out into hops yards and learn in the summer. So we'll make a hops yard you can go around and learn in in the winter. Scroll up to flip it. As much as the players will learn by doing, the same was true for the developers. 
I didn't know very much about hop plants. Um, and so what we did is we went with our artists and we went there and we scouted for bugs and we got to see Japanese beetles up close and look for them. And before that, we were kind of struggling a little bit to capture them and get them to look the right way because you can't get the same kind of detail until you've seen it. So I got much closer with bugs and pests of all types during this process. Definite learning process for, from both sides. Right now, the game is still a prototype. Game Theory and Darby want to expand to different platforms so it can be played on laptops and mobile phones. And there are also plans to develop similar games to deal with animal husbandry and soil science. Darby hopes this project will inspire other innovators in the fields of game design and agronomy. It's exciting to get something out the door and hopefully inspire other um, extension folks around the country to start using similar technology to, to train farmers in any number of you know, areas. Part of being innovative and cutting edge and staying in a market or adapting uh, to a market is just understanding that you constantly have to be looking forward. In the game world or in the real world, learning always wins. In Burlington, I'm Keith Silva with Across the Fence. Very interesting and very 21st century. Our next segment could best be described as fashionable. We've all heard of it, and if you're a parent, you've said it more than once, don't go outside without your coat. When the weather is cold, it means more layers or heavier coats. Nowadays, cheaper synthetic fibers have filled in for more expensive natural insulators like down. But now a Vermont company is working with a homegrown filler to counter the colder weather. It's made from a fiber that many of us find in our backyards or blowing in the breeze. Rebecca Gollan has our story. This is milkweed. It's a wildflower that's found in Vermont and around the Northeast. It's long been a nuisance for farmers, growing readily on roadsides and in backyards. But it's a favorite of pollinators, especially monarch butterflies, who lay their eggs and feed on the plant. Along with the environmental benefits, milkweed produces a fiber that's lightweight, water repellent, and most important for Vermonters, it's warm. It's great. It's very lightweight, which I really like. And it's um, very warm, and it blocks the wind. Um, that's partly from the cover fabric. What is so incredible about this particular fiber, it can be used for all sorts of different purposes. It can be stuffing inside a jacket. It can be used for flotations and life jackets. Kimberly Hagen and Susie Hodgson work at the University of Vermont's Center for Sustainable Agriculture. They're spearheading a project that looks at the costs and benefits of growing milkweed as a crop here in Vermont. That project led them to Charlotte Sullivan. We've done a lot of research and development. We've made a lot of different jacket prototypes. We've worked a lot with raw milkweed floss, which is that those the little parachutes that attach themselves to the seeds. Sullivan is an artist and founder of the clothing company May West. She and her partner are experimenting with using milkweed in their jackets. It's not a new idea, but certainly our application of it is. Sullivan has spent time working in agriculture, and that experience informs what she's hoping to create. As someone who's, who always works outside, I don't like feeling like I'm, what I'm having to wear in cold weather is cumbersome, it's hard to move in. I don't like having to have a lot of layers. The thought of being able to wear something that's not synthetic, that's thin and malleable um, and flexible while being you know, warm and also naturally water resistant just seemed too good to be true. Through the partnership with UVM, Sullivan was able to get raw milkweed fiber to experiment with. After some testing, the company is pretty close to a design that can be produced on a larger scale. Most recently, we've also been able to start prototyping jackets using milkweed in a batting form. So what that means is it's a material that you can actually cut. It's in a roll, and you can cut it out and then sh sort of insert it into a pattern. We've been able to make different jackets and sort of test them out and feel them and experiment with different materials. Those two were before the batting, and then Kimberly and I are wearing jackets that actually have um, batting quilted to the inside on mine on the inside layer and on Kimberly's on the outside 
For Hodgson and Hagen, it's still the early days in terms of figuring out the best practices for growing milkweed as a crop and other resources for farmers. Answers won't come immediately, as it takes at least three years to establish the plant as a crop. But these researchers think there's promise. Two-thirds of the American public think using renewables is important. Most people think of renewables or think of energy, and now people are starting to think of Actually, what about everything else we use in our house? Not just the food we buy, but let's think about the clothes that we buy and wear. Are they made in a sustainable way? In the long run, this will be great for Vermont farmers because we have a product that grows here already, um, you know, and happily so, and that we can use it. It's a new way for farmers to diversify while giving some important pollinators the habitat they need. And while the economic results are not finalized, so far, milkweed is proving to be beneficial all around. When I learned that there was that connectivity with milkweed and monarchs and how, of course, with, with my farming background, knowing that without pollinators, it's, you know, it doesn't matter how much you know about growing food, you don't have anything, it was just so <laughs> clear that we really had to keep working with this material and develop a way for it to be used in the market. So this is really new. Yep. This, this Bringing is new products to life raw, with a sustainable raw, fiber with that could give some new options to Vermont's farmers. In Middlebury, I'm Rebecca Gullen with Across the Fence. Thank you, Rebecca. And once again, thank you for joining us Across the Fence. I'm Fran Stoddard.